Welcome, everybody. This is a uh, well, kind of welcome back. We didn't do last month. This is the first, first, first Thursday of this year, 2022. I um, skipped last month. I was on vacation. I'm back and have the intention to continue this series, this offering from World Services um, once a month, every first Thursday, teacher led. Uh, meditation and discussion. Um, and anybody that's here for their first time, welcome. And reminder, this is not a refuge recovery meeting. It's not a refuge recovery peer-led meeting. Um, this is an actual teacher-led meeting. I, um, I've been teaching the Dharma for over 20 years, teaching Buddhism and created the refuge recovery program. And, you know, part of Part of refuge recovery is, intention is, you know, it's primarily to provide the support for the peer-led meetings that I'd imagine you're all involved in and, and the importance of us just as peers helping each other. But then there's absolutely a place for having relationship with teachers, with people that are ahead of us on the path, not just mentors, but actual Dharma teachers to answer our questions and uh, give us some guidance and, and hopefully support and inspire us. And, and that becomes especially important when it's time to go on meditation retreats. Um, you can't go, you know, it's not so easy to do a retreat on your own. You really need a qualified meditation teacher to take you through the process of silent uh, mindfulness retreats. And so that's something that I do and have been doing for a very long time. And, and, um, you know, so a couple of years ago, we said, hey, let's do Monday, night, you know, let's do Thursday night uh, offering for the community so I can be a resource for questions and a resource to offer some guidance. So welcome if you're here for the first time. I um, actually don't have a topic. Maybe in our discussion tonight, we can come up with some topics and maybe I'll, last year I did some series. I did a series of the heart practices and a little bit more in depth into the mindfulness practices and forgiveness. And um, I don't know, I might've even said that I had a topic for tonight. I don't know if anybody remembers, but I don't recall uh, <laughs> planning a topic for tonight. So I'm just going to kind of freestyle. We'll start with a meditation and then we'll get into some, some discussion. And um, those of you who are, uh, participating and really working the refuge recovery program, as you see, uh, it's a systematic training from the earliest practice of mindfulness of the breath, the initial mindfulness instruction of the breath, and the encouragement from the beginning to alternate breath awareness, mindfulness practice with um, forgiveness practice. But from there, mindfulness expands to the four foundations, um, breath and body and feeling tone and mind states and the truth of our experience. The heart practices expand from forgiveness to include loving kindness and compassion and appreciation and uh, equanimity. Um, and we practice them systematically. If you're going to meetings, you're hearing them, you're practicing them. If you are working with a mentor, perhaps um, you, you know, you've been encouraged to say like, hey, go deeper into this. Maybe you're following the initial instruction, which is alternate, include a forgiveness practice in your daily meditation practice, basically for the rest of your life. The encouragement in the book says, uh, keep practicing the forgiveness meditation until you have no more resentments. And so, you know, if you're at a place already where your mind is not uh, judging and critical and resentful, okay, you can stop the forgiveness. But if that stuff arises, use the forgiveness as an ongoing practice. I'm 33 years into my meditation practice and forgiveness continues to be a, a core part of it. Um, because the mind is a, a judgmental machine and, um, and, and, and a self-centered, uh, you know, mind that likes to cop resentment. So forgiveness is the antidote, is the balance, is the, 
uh, training of our minds to not cling, but to let go out of compassion and not only compassion for ourselves, but compassion for others. Anyways, I'm not trying to go too far down into that uh, well right now, but more what I wanted to say in the meditation that I'll lead tonight is that my own experience of after having done many years of mindfulness practice and the heart practices um, as separate practices, where I was just doing mindfulness or I was just doing loving kindness or I was just doing forgiveness, that eventually my own personal practice came to be where I just sit, sit down in meditation and I establish mindfulness, present time, non-judgmental awareness. And then I just explore what's here right now. What emotions are present? What sensations are present? What mood is present? And having developed the tools to, oh, there's some resentment in the heart or the mind. Let me meet that with some forgiveness. Or there's some actual real joy here. There's some pleasure. There's some excitement in the mind and body. Let me meet that with appreciation. Having developed appreciation through the systematic process of appreciative joy, having developed compassion, it becomes more accessible. And so eventually you get to the place where you don't have to do those practices. You just sit here, (laughs) turn towards check in and have the appropriate response, which is compassion for our pain, forgiveness, loving kindness, appreciation, and understanding that none of it is as personal as we tend to take it. Um, I hope that makes sense. If it doesn't make sense yet, uh, it probably will eventually, I think. I think it will eventually. So let's have a period of meditation where I'll share with you a little bit of my process with meditation, then we can have some discussion. So find a way to sit that's upright, relaxed. Allowing your eyes to be gently closed. Releasing any tension that you may be holding from the eyes or jaw, shoulders or belly, soften. Each exhale, a releasing, a letting go. Feel the breath, receive the sensations, breathing in. No, this is an in-breath, breathing out. No, this is an out-breath, an exhale. In this way, letting the thoughts be in the background. As we attune our attention to the body and the awareness itself, coming from the body, embodied awareness, feeling the sensations of the body with the body. What I mean by that is if it seems like you're observing your body from consciousness, which resides in your brain, Invite that awareness to descend out of the brain, through the face, down through the neck and shoulders, to the trunk of the body and out into the arms and legs. So that you're paying attention to the breath, to the body, with the body, not from some detached, watchtower of consciousness.
And as we settle into present time awareness of the body, first foundation, establishing an attitude of loving kindness, of friendliness, directing the heart towards compassion and appreciation. That internal reminder that my intention is to be kind to my own mind, body, to the sounds that arise, the sensations, and the thoughts and emotions. an attitude, an intention of friendliness. Let the breath be anchoring, grounding, always returning in the beginning here to just what does my breath feel like? First, disengaging from the mind so that we can return to it with a different awareness. If you're new, you can just keep returning to the breath or add in the forgiveness phrases. I forgive you 
as much as I can in this moment to yourself, to the people who you resent, as well as asking for forgiveness for those who we've caused harm to some way or another, intentionally or unintentionally. You can begin to open your awareness to their, to your whole being. Your whole body, your mind, heart, emotions. Ultimately, mindfulness is inclusive, present time awareness of our whole being. Nothing left out, no part unacceptable, nothing that's happening shouldn't be happening, all, all of it met with awareness and with as much kindness as we can in this moment. The more we open in this way, the more we see not only what's happening, but how it feels. What thoughts are present and whether these thoughts are pleasant or unpleasant or neutral. The sounds that we perceive whether they feel or perceived as pleasant or unpleasant, as we incline our intention to respond with compassion to all of the unpleasant sense door experience, thoughts and emotions with tolerance and mercy and compassion. May I accept this moment just as it is and respond as wisely as possible, meeting the pleasure with non-attached appreciation, meeting the pain or unpleasant phenomena with as much compassion as I can in this moment.
as you become aware of what your mind is doing and identify this is a plan or a memory, a hope or a fear, a resentment, judgment. Getting to meet those mind states with the wise response. Forgiveness, always appropriate. Compassion towards how unpleasant it is to experience fear or worry. Compassion for how unpleasant it is to experience craving, that feeling of needing, clinging. And try softening the belly, relaxing the shoulders, releasing the jaw. Allowing this impermanent craving to arise and pass, this judgment, resentment to be met with forgiveness. Everything that arises passes. This mind continues to think and have all of its wonderful abilities to be creative and intelligent and reflective. And all of its not so skillful habits of judging and comparing and feeling anxious and afraid, resentful. The habit of taking everything very personal. Make more and more room for these just being thoughts as part of the natural, universal, human condition, not your fault. bringing loving kindness to your own heart and mind, compassion to this mind, this body. And extending this kindness, compassion, appreciation to everyone gathered here tonight, Refuge Recovery Sangha, all of the people in your life that supported you in your process of recovery.
just as I wish to be happy, may you find happiness. May you do what needs to be done to free yourself from suffering, from confusion. Extending this wish to each other and then outward in all directions towards this planet, this world. May all beings be met with kindness and compassion, forgiveness. May all beings find the willingness to do what needs to be done to train their heart, their mind, to let go, to forgive. And to respond with kindness and appreciation towards each other. Thinking about this whole planet, the billions of humans and beyond the human realm, reflecting on all of the animals and all the sky and sea and earth is worthy of your loving kindness. And then remember the Buddha's teaching that we could search all realms of existence and never find anyone more worthy of our love than ourselves. So breathe that into your heart, whether you feel it or know it yet. Feel it, breathe in the possibility of coming to Understand that you're totally and completely worthy, deserving of your own love and kindness, compassion and forgiveness. And keep going in that direction. This direction of healing and recovering reliable internal refuge. When you're ready, you can allow your eyes to open, bring your attention back to the screen, a Zoom room. My sense is that in the beginning, my experience in the beginning of studying, practicing Buddhism, is it felt a little complicated. There's the four noble truths, there's the eightfold path, there's four foundations of mindfulness, there's five precepts, there's three characters, you know, it's just like all of these lists. I'm like, well, this is fucking math. <laughs> This is feels complicated. And then the more you, you know, you kind of, you read the book and you study it and you practice it and it actually becomes quite simple. All of those lists and teachings guiding us to 
let go. Let go of that which we're clinging to, that which is causing us suffering. Forgiveness is letting go. And, you know, simply uh, we have to learn to, to turn towards the pain rather than away from it and have compassion for it. Let go and have compassion and then ultimately turn towards this and investigate the, you know, four foundations of mindfulness, this human experience, so that you can see how impersonal it is. And then it's really not your fault that you have a self-centered uh, mind, but it's just the human condition. But even though it's not our fault, it's totally our responsibility to change our relationship to it. And that's what we're doing in refuge recovery is we're taking full responsibility for our recovery, for our happiness, for our freedom. And we have this awesome map. And, you know, as I said, if you're new, I know it seems a little complicated. The more you digest it and the more you'll see like, oh, this is all really quite simple. Be honest and be kind and let go and be compassionate and forgiving. It's like, you know, the words are one thing, but the meditation leads us to the experience. Oh, this is what it's like to let go. This is what it's like to have a moment of forgiveness or kindness or um, appreciation of really being in the midst of something wonderful and appreciating it without ruining it by clinging to it. How often have we done that in our lives? In the midst of something wonderful, sabotaging it with our clinging and our attachment and our fear of it ending. So I'm going to leave it there tonight and open to conversation with you. Um, questions, comments, clarifications. I would kind of feel like mostly about meditation, but anything you want to talk to about. Uh, Vanessa, go ahead, jump in. Okay, let me lower my hand. Um, thank you for the talk, uh, the offering. Um, I got this question the other day and this is kind of like commentary and question. Um, I couldn't answer it per se. Like I used to kind of be able to answer it, but I'm finding like the more I practice, the more like ineffable, like I can't like articulate what's happening to me at all. Like, does, I don't know. Like I, I'm even having a hard time expressing, um, uh, finding words for what's happening in inside. And when I sit and how things are working and not just when I sit, but like everything, how it's being changed. Anywho, I got this question the other day and I just ended up doing what I'm doing now, which is like stumbling all over the place and not being able to articulate anything. And, um, but the question was meditation. How do you know you're doing it right? Um, well, it depends on what we mean. You know, again, you have to sort of unpack. Meditation means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. So I would have to like in, inquire a little bit more into that person, the, like the questioner. Um, mindfulness, how do you know if you're doing it right? Or loving kindness, how do you know if you're doing it right? Or, you know, which meditation? Because if we, if we just say meditation, you know, I, I need to kind of unpack it a little bit in order to, uh, and some of the answer here is, um, you know, through dialogue with an experienced teacher or meditator or friend who, you know, who's had some experience with it, you say, hey, this is what I'm doing. Does that sound right? And they say, oh, yeah, that sounds right. <laughs> right? Like, you, you know, kind of based uh, on sometimes by some uh, feedback. Um, the other way, which is the sort of longer way to know, am I doing it right, is, uh, is it decreasing your suffering? Is it increasing your ability to meet your experience with compassion, your um, experience with non-attachment? Uh, is it increasing your skill at not uh, always being so reactive and, and having a bit more 
patience and tolerance and, and mercy, right? And so the, the problem with that second answer is that um, you're going to have to do it every day for a couple of years before you decide if it's working or not, because it's not like you can be like, yeah, I meditated three times and it didn't work. I'm still reactive and self-centered and but it's more, I've been applying this technique of mindfulness or loving kindness or uh, forgiveness daily for five years. And I see the benefits. I see how much forgiveness has taken place and how much more compassionate I've become over the years of my practice. And that, you know, um, so does it work? But you can't be too quick to decide whether it's working or not, because it's such a gradual process. Um, and I, I don't know, I'm, I've, I'm a big fan of, I've really appreciated that I've had some great meditation teachers where I can say like, okay, this is what I heard the instructions as, and this is what I'm doing in my practice. Like one of the things on meditation retreats that we do, and it's maybe one of the only times that most of us really get that opportun opportunity um, is um, you go on retreat and then you have a you know conversation with the meditation you know retreat teacher and they say like okay what are you doing in your meditation where's your attention going and how are you relating to the experiences and then they're able to kind of walk us through and maybe give us some like oh we'll try this technique or try that technique um, you know, it's one of the problems with a peer-led program uh, of not having teachers. What we're doing in refuge recovery is totally necessary because we wouldn't be able to have a qualified meditation teacher in every meeting. So we really need to do this thing as peers and support each other. And there'll be people that you'll meet who've been meditating for many years and, you know, are able to mentor you in, in really skillful ways. And there's a place for consulting with uh, qualified teachers. And these days, it's so hard to tell who's a qualified teacher or not because, you know, every, everybody's trying to sell their meditation uh, classes on social and on Instagram <laughs> and be like, yo, I took a course. I'm a meditation teacher. You know, every yoga teacher is a meditation teacher. Um, you know, it's it's a little like kind of, oh, are you really like? are you really a meditation teacher or did you just decide that that's what you're going to be without any real training? Um, so I think, you know, some healthy skepticism about, about who we ask is also important. Um, was that helpful, Vanessa? Yeah, it was, but it's kind of like, um, you know, there's a question in the, the chat about like this gaining mind, um, bring up the concept of this, like I'm doing this to have an outcome to get something. Like I was just listening to an Amaro podcast today and it was kind of about like abandoning, abandoning all outcome, like getting rid of self and humility and all that. And like, that's where the teaching get a little like um, less worldly. But from, you know, I usually, um, offer the advice of, you know, like the Dalai Lama is like check in with your meditation every 10 years type thing. It takes a long time, but it's also like not linear, right? Like I'm, I don't always progress. I sometimes like fall back. And sometimes I'm like devastated by my practice. Sometimes when I practice, I'm way more miserable than before. And when I was new to brand new, I mean, I'm still new to practice. I'll be new forever, but like when I was brand new, shit was a lot worse before it got better because all I could see was like everything. And I was like, this is awful. This shit does not work. Like this feels terrible. Yeah. So I don't know, like, so by that, you know, like to say like, is this making you, and I think that the, the, the general idea is like, just give it time. Like when I look at it all over five year span, yeah, I'm suffering a lot less, but it's, it's hard to compare that over such vast period of time, you know? Yeah, hundred percent. Well, and you've probably heard me at some time say like, um, you know, one of the ways you'll know that it's work is that it's working is that it will actually make you feel a little bit worse before it makes you feel better. <laughs> so, you know, like if you're meditating and it's all bliss all of the time, you're probably not doing it right. <laughs> 
<laughs> if you really, you know, are like, oh, meditation's amazing. And I'm just so, it's like, oh, you're probably missing something because what we're doing is unearthing the core suffering in our life. And if you're avoiding that and just blissing out in meditation, you're avoiding the, you know, the kind of the first noble truth. Like, where's that? But the reality is, like you're saying, is we've spent so much time avoiding the truth of our suffering. When we sit down to meditate, it's right here. Oh, wow, look at all this suffering I've been ignoring and suppressing and drinking and using and, you know, avoiding with all of. And so here it is, even in recovery, people who don't meditate, um, you know, are, are quite good at avoidance. Meditation is non-avoidance. It's turning towards. So of course it feels a little bit worse. That means it's working. And then long-term, you start to get some actual freedom. That's not ignorance, uh, suppression, avoidance, uh, freedom, but I can, you know, the, the ability to be with our own pain and not so reactive to it, more compassionate to it. So that any, any sort of, um, guideline around like, does it feel good or not is not the right measure. It's not, does it feel good or not? It's, am I increasing my ability to be with the unpleasant mind states and sensations? And, they, and you'll see that pretty early on. Yes, I'm increasing my tolerance. I'm increasing my ability to be with. It's not making them go away. It's not making me feel happy all of the time right away, but I'm increasing my tolerance. You know, this comment in the, um, about no gaining mind, there's a comment, a, a question in the chat. How does it fit into the teachings? Oh, that's important to meditate with no gaining mind. Um, I think there's that's wisdom in there, and I'm sure that that is in some teachings. And uh, no gaining mind sounds kind of Zen to me, like maybe a Japanese Zen kind of thing, maybe. Uh, and it's beautiful. I like it. There's wisdom in that. No gaining mind, kind of breaking that uh, way that we can even turn our meditation practice, our spiritual practice into another thing that we crave for and we cling for, and we're looking for gains, and we're you know. Um, and we have to be careful of that. We can turn our recovery into another thing we suffer about, our meditation into another thing we suffer about. So there's wisdom in that, like, hey, don't be too attached to outcomes. But the way that the Buddha taught the Four Noble Truths is very much outcome-driven. There is a goal. The goal is freedom. In order to get to freedom, it takes a lot of effort. So there's no effortless recovery. There's no effortless liberation. Yes, we have to have the, it's, it's part of the second factor, the, the wise intentions, the wise goals, the wise aims, making sure that we're pointed towards freedom, towards recovery, towards love and service and compassion, we're trying to uncover and regain and recover wisdom and compassion. And so we can't use this, um, you know, perspective of, you know, a wise caution to say like, oh, I'm not allowed to try hard. You're going to have to try really, my experience has been, I've had to try really hard for a really long time. I might have said this in this Thursday nights before, but there's this Tibetan um, master and they find him in a cave and he's like a compassion master, just developed compassion for all living beings. And And they ask him, how did you do it? And he pulls up his robes and he shows them their, his ass. And he says, you see my ass? You see all these like bruises and calluses on my ass? <laughs> That's how I developed compassion. I sat here in this cave, putting the effort in to train my heart for the benefit of all living beings to be compassionate. This didn't happen all by itself. This happened because I set a goal 
and I put the effort in to obtain the goal. The goal wasn't a selfish one. It wasn't for my liberation. It was an altruistic one for compassion for all living beings, which of course the byproduct is one's own freedom. Richard, go ahead and jump in. Thanks, Noah. I was just leaving a note about that being Milarepa showing Gampopa, his student, his ass. That was his last teaching. So thanks for that image. Uh, it I does take a lot of my last teaching too. Like, it's, you know, it's a great lineage. <laughs> yeah. moon, moon the Sangha on your way out. <laughs> anyway, thanks for tonight. Thanks for this teaching that you've given us. And, you know, it really speaks to me about, uh, as you said earlier, is about being able to, in time, being able to sit with your mindfulness practice and let the heart practices, they're not practices, just let the qualities just naturally bubble up, just be there. And that, that more and more is my experience the more I do this, this meditation work. This, so I appreciate your, your mentioning that tonight. It doesn't have to be two different things. That we can have a mindful heart and a heartful mind. Yeah. Well, you've probably heard me say before, and I don't think I say this in the refuge book, but if you look at the Buddha's, you know, eightfold path, he doesn't teach the heart practices because right. mindfulness led to the experience of loving kindness, compassion, appreciation, equanimity. They came out of mindfulness. Now, later he realized uh, mindfulness will get you there eventually, but it's actually quite helpful to have some techniques of loving kindness and forgiveness techniques. And rather than just waiting for mindfulness to reveal the natural wisdom and compassion, actually, here's some trainings to help you uncover them and develop those qualities in your, in your life. Um, but they're not separate. You know, even the term wisdom and compassion is a false duality. Compassion is not separate from wisdom. It's just wisdom. And the only wise relationship to pain is compassion, period. It's just wisdom. But for some reason, we have this dualistic heart-mind, you know, separation. So we have to say, and compassion. <laughs> but of course, compassion is just an aspect of wisdom. Well, I didn't think I was going to talk about this tonight, and some part of this may be better saved for the uh, Q&A that's, I think, happening in March, but I'm going to float it out tonight and see what you think about it. Um, so, much of, so much of this path, and it's been incredibly beneficial for me in my recovery from drugs, alcohol, process addictions, I can't say enough good things about refuge in that regard. Having been practicing now on this path for a few years. The healing has been happening. I feel very different in my body and spirit, in my mind. Um, and it's good. And I'm really appreciative of this. Of this. And, and, and so much of this practice seems to be focused on individual development, individual sitting, individual work, individual, you know, meditation. And it's good. And it has to be that. I'm not saying it doesn't. But then there's this community aspect through the Sangha, through being at meetings and talking with people and showing up and being of service and mentoring. And that's how we're help helping each other as well on this healing path. And I welcome that as well and have been involved in that, as you know. And yet there's a part of your book, I'm going to the last paragraph in the Path to Heartfulness, where you have a sentence that you've written said, um, I'll back it up a little bit here, saying we all have to do the digging ourselves, which you talked about with efforts, hopefully in the, with the support of teachers and community, we will be ultimately up to us to do the heavy lifting and letting go as the case may be. Your life will transform as ours have, and here's the key sentence I want to focus on, and together we will create positive change in this world. And that occurs to me to take that to a level of how we can share this great wealth of what we're experiencing here in refuge and take it out into the world. And we do in our ordinary daily lives, I know I do, I try to at least, and how we can do that. But yet 
still, it seems to me that there is a place in, in the development of refuge as a whole, especially as we're gonna be coming out of COVID isolation, I hope in this year of 2022, with the year of the tiger and it's gonna be all this new energy and we're gonna be able to come out more into the community, that there's a place within refuge where we can share what we've gained here in refuge in our communities and do it in a, uh, an, I don't know if an organized way is the right word, but in a, in a uh, developed way, in a sense of like taking compassion, putting compassion into action. And I'm not even sure what that would look like. Yes, there are forms from other programs like 12 Step has their H and I, and there's other ways to do this out in the community. But I want us, I think I, I would like to see more conversation here or maybe at the Q and A, but all together that we are finding uh, vehicles for greater service in our communities using what we're learning here and how we're developing in refuge for the sake of effecting positive change in the world, as you call for. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, it does. Uh, it does. And of course, positive change is a very broad thing. And, and what you're talking about, um, I mean, and I feel like you mostly said it, Richard, which is uh, first and foremost, the positive change that we create is through our own transformation, our own, you know, not being an act of addiction, practicing honesty and integrity and kindness in the world. That is transformative in your relationships and your families and in a kind of like the thousands, the millions of us addicts who are no longer going to be an act of addiction because we're in guard engaged in this form of recovery. That in itself has a huge ripple effect in the world. So just your abstinence, your, my, my, your, you know, all of us, um, there, there's less harm caused and that is a positive change on the planet. Um, what you're saying about service and kind of on a group level, we have to, you know, always remember that our kind of, you know, focus is recovery from addiction. And so any kind of positive change about helping addicts recover 100% you know, there's, there are meetings in jails and prisons and psych wards. There have been, there will be, we will 100% support in this community. We'll do more and more outreach to help people recover from addiction. But that's the full scope of positive change that refuge recovery groups should be in, involved in. As individuals, People might get socially, politically active, environmentally, you know, you know, all kinds of good causes to, to get yourself behind. But as far as a refuge recovery um, based outreach, it's going to have to be very clearly just about carrying this uh, message to, to addicts who are seeking help. Um, and that we can't go beyond that scope. It would be against our guiding principles um, to start taking stances on, you know, political movements or anything like that. I wasn't speaking to that. I have a personal thing, uh, uh, dog in the fight too. My cousin's son, 20, no, he was 19, 19 year old son living outside Omaha, uh, OD'd last month uh, from opiates and in talking with her about her son, and I was telling her about my experience in refuge. She says, well, I wish we had something like that out here in Omaha. Yeah. And I, you know, and then, and then this being a young person, this being a teenager, it really affected me. It's like, how come I can't take, how come I'm not taking this message to teenagers? How come I'm not bringing this message that this great gift that I'm getting through refuge to this population? Yeah. 100% for the last, from the beginning, we've been, uh, you know, sort of get it, trying to get things started and some things have started and then, you know, splits and pandemics and, um, but 100%, I agree with you that uh, the more outreach we can do, and it's always that balance, you know, with outreach, it's, uh, I'm a big fan of that 12 step perspective that says attraction rather than promotion. Um, but, uh, 
uh, you know, and we we have that same sort of feeling of like, hey, we're we're want to be of service, but you don't want to become too proselytizing, but you want to make it available uh, in Omaha and everywhere else, and in the jails and the institutions, and you want to make it available for those who are seeking it and who are interested in it without kind of crossing over into some kind of preachy, we have the best recovery and everyone else sucks and we're the best, <laughs> you know, we want to be quite, uh, you know, just open-handed in the way that we offer it and, and going into, but for sure, you know, there's so many places where, where, where that are saying like, hey, we're open to all forms of recovery, but they're really only getting 12 step perspective and they're not getting refuge perspective. And so uh, that's gonna happen gradually and organically in, in, our, in our program. I'm saying this tonight in order to promote more dialogue within refuge about it. I don't have any solutions necessarily, but I would like for us to have more open discussion about it. And I'll probably bring it back to the Q and A in March as well. Cool, yeah, let's keep talking Thank about it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, last two questions, Eric first and then Amy. You are still muted, Eric. Hey. You hear me now? Yes. So I was like, you know, this whole thing about, the thing that really interests me is like this whole thing about like, how do you deal with like some of the things you might've done in your past? Like that's, that's sort of like the problem that I'm having. It's like, God, you know, I grew up, you grew up in Santa Cruz. I grew up in Atlantic City, New Jersey. And it's like, I've done horrible things to people. I have done, I have pushed people off a pier. I've punched people in the face. Like I've done like really horrible things. Like, I wonder how do you like come to terms with that? You know, as a Buddhist, like how do you get around that dude? Cause you know, I still feel bad about it, dude. It's like I shouldn't have done it to begin with. Well, first, but, I, but I was put in a position to where that was the normal behavior. Well, I mean, that's the um, that's the piece that you're uh, the position that we were in, uh, the underlying. You know, why uh, why did I cause harm? Uh, because I was confused. Because I was suffering. Because right. I was afraid. Um, you and you're just like defending whatever. yourself, defending like whatever you have, like, you yeah. know, all of those, all of those, you know, but, but getting to the core underlying, I was suffering. Right. I never threw anybody off a pier or whatever the, you know, example is <laughs> out of uh, wisdom. I did it out of ignorance and out of fear and out of confusion. Right. And so if you can kind of get to that place where we can start to have some compassion. Right. I was suffering and my suffering spilled out. Right. Onto the and, and it caused bad reactions, but yeah, it's better to actually see the bigger picture and just, you know, this is why I'm Buddhist as well. Um, but yeah, like, I don't know, man, it's some regrets, man. I don't know. So the forgiveness practice, my experience with the forgiveness practice is, uh, cause I very much felt like that in my early recovery. I was like, I can't, I'm unforgivable. And, and my teacher yeah, said, well, exactly. just start saying it to yourself, uh, right. even though you don't mean it. Right. Say it to yourself, I forgive, I forgive you, I forgive myself as much as I can in this moment. That's like the hardest thing, forgiving yourself. That's, that's exactly what I was like getting to. Like forgiving yourself is really difficult for me, or it depends, like, you know, it, you know that's the hard part. Know that it's going to take years. Right. No, no two things, Eric. One is it's going to take years, probably, mm -hmm. and probably. it will never happen if you don't do it. Right. If you don't, you know, like you're never going to just magically, you know, forgive yourself. Which but I wish, which I wish would be true, but that's not going to happen. If you do the forgiveness phrases every day or every other day, <sighs> you know, and really like take this on as a task. Do right. the forgiveness, self-forgiveness meditation every day for 90 days. Okay. And then, you know, or, or for, you know, and then, and then check like, oh, is, how's the inner tone? How's the resistance? Is it changing a little bit after 90 days of this? After you know, that makes perfect sense because honestly, you have to work for anything that really is valuable, right? Yes. I mean, that, that makes sense. Like, it makes sense. Okay, well, I just had to ask you that because, man, I've been struggling with that for a minute, but it's okay. 
Yeah, and that, that important piece of like, well, yes, I caused a lot of harm and it's yeah. because I was so confused and having yeah, some compassion for your confusion. And I, I was in a place mm-hmm. where it was like, this is the way it is. Like, let's hurt people. And it's like, that's, you know, like I've gotten older. I'm like, that's not really what I want from this life. I don't want to hurt people. Like, you know, it's just interesting, but you know. And we have all of the karma from those actions. We own the karma from those actions. And we're purifying the karma from those actions with our positive actions, with our acts of kindness and generosity and service. That's the only way to clean up. You know, there's, there's, there's some wreckage, you know, there's some direct amends that we get into and that's important too but it's mm-hmm. changing our behavior and becoming more kind and positive and protecting each other rather than harming each other. And that purifies the karma. You no, know, that's exactly true because that's how I am now. It just wasn't like that then. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm just trying to let it go. I'll let you get to the next question. Yeah, thanks. Amy, last one. One, one love, buddy. Oh, hey, it's not the question. I'll be fast. But um, the ripple effect of just being a sober person who owns their shit every morning and lets other people see them recognize their own suffering and delusion and just owning it. Being a few years out and the parent of a teenager is it blows my mind how real that is. So real. And it's so fucking beautiful. And I remember you saying that a few years ago and thinking, I don't think that's right. And now just the ripple effect of just being that human being is wonderful. And uh, so thanks. That's it. Very welcome. Um, I, saw a com- I saw a comment in the uh, chat that said some harm cannot be repaired. And that is absolutely true. Um, some things are unforgivable, some harm cannot be repaired, but uh, it doesn't mean that there can't be a deep experience of forgiveness. And um, even if it's unrepairable or unforgivable action, uh, as we talk about in the refuge process that we're forgiving the actor, um, not the actions. And so that we're, we're working with our own heart and mind and the hearts and minds of other confused people and forgiveness is not always a repair and an amends, even in a, even a really thorough, wise and uh, amends isn't necessarily gonna repair something. It's just the intention and the willingness to repair something if it's possible. Sometimes it's impossible. And that there's just an acceptance of, this is something that I can't repair. I just have to forgive myself, them, each other. So uh, that's my, that's my thoughts for tonight. I hope this was useful. You know, one of the things that the Buddha, um, I think almost always said after he shared teachings is he said to whoever was listening to him, it it is now time for you to do as you see fit. And so he would share, he'd say, here's the four, here's the path to liberation. Here's how you end suffering. Like very, you know, confident, clear, this is what needs to be done. And then he would pull back and say, but don't take my word for it. You have to find out for yourself. It's time for you to reflect on these teachings, see how it goes when you verify it with your own direct experience, and you do as you see fit rather than, you know, Buddhism is definitely not a blind faith kind of thing, refuge recovery, really clearly, like this is your here by your choice, you're experimenting with it, you're, some of you are verified, uh, you know, members of like, this is my path but you get to be the ultimate authority in your path. There's no guru uh, kind of scene here. Here's the teachings. Here's my experience with them. You find your way with it yourself. So um, it is believed that any, um, well, a couple of announcements before I offer the merit. One is, this class is, this group is, is freely offered. Um, there's obviously, there's no charge, just like refuge recovery, but maybe um, it is appropriate to be generous and to, to make donations. Refuge Recovery World Services is supplying, supporting this. I'm here as a volunteer to, to share these teachings. Uh, I'm not being compensated for this time. Your generosity to Refuge Recovery World Services makes what I do, what we do at World Services possible. 
your support for World Services. So please consider when you come on uh, these first Thursdays of making a donation to, to World Services to support us supporting the refuge recovery um, program. Aren't you guys uh, having a camp out soon? Like a, a thing? Yes, second announcement <laughs> is that in um, June, June 10th through 12th, the eighth annual Refuge Recovery Conference is happening Southern California, up in the mountains near Big Bear. It's a um, two night, it's a weekend uh, camp out. Um, it's like in a, in a camp. And so there's cabins there, you can bring a tent and camp and we're gonna have meetings and meditations and discussions and um, please, please join us. It's a great way to come and connect with the broader Sangha and people from all over. Uh, the country usually come and and a lot of you are our zoom sangha and you've mostly just connected with each other uh through you know this virtual medium so cool to come and be in person well, last I didn't year, even open, so i'm not that far away <laughs> last year at the conference um you know there i just so beautiful to watch so many people uh who uh, really developed relationships but had never met uh, in person, come and meet each other and and connect. So I hope that that is the case again this year, and I hope many of you choose to join us. And um, I'll see you next month for this uh, first Thursday, and we'll end by offering the merit, many goodness that comes from our practice and discussion of the Buddha Dharma, our our wise intentions to experience refuge and provide a refuge for each other. May this merit, this goodness, these offerings be shared outward in all directions with all suffering addicts and all of the non-addicts who are also suffering. May each one of us do what needs to be done to get free. And together, may we create a positive change on this planet. Thank you, and uh, see you next time. Sorry, thanks, out of time. Noah. If people want to have other questions, Nicole, if you had a question, you.